thank you for joining us on the Person of Person Network. Welcome to Profiles in STEM. Our career series will feature an amazing STEM professional who is shaping lives and building the future. I'm your host, Katie Colbert, and joining me today, we have a very special guest, Dr. George Matsumoto. Dr. Matsumoto is a Senior Education and Research Specialist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and Research Institute, or Ambari, in Moss Landing, California. He is heavily involved in open ocean and deep sea organism research, as well as educational outreach projects at Mbari. Dr. Matsumoto, welcome to our program. Dr. Matsumoto, let's go back in time. Can you share with us a specific moment that inspired you to pursue a career in STEM? Sure, I could do that. And thank you very much, Katie, for that lovely introduction and for inviting me to be on the program with you. I think. I think one of the first things I remember is when I was probably in fifth grade and my parents had signed me up for a snorkeling trip off one of the Channel Islands off the coast of California. And that was remarkable, uh, not because my parents signed me up for a trip, which parents do all the time to their children, uh, but mostly because yeah. it was the first time I had put on a mask and a snorkel and actually looked underneath the surface of the water. And that just literally and figuratively opened up my eyes to the world that was below the surface. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that awesome memory with us. So it seems like you have always loved the water and marine life. During the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair, ICF, I had the opportunity to listen to you speak about your research on deep sea comb jellies. Can you talk to us about your latest research? Maybe expand on the computer modules you are currently working on. Sure. So some of my latest research is has veered away a little bit from the comb jellies and has moved more towards the more typical jellies or jellyfish that people are used to thinking about when they think about jellies. And all of the work that we're doing these days involves a lot of computer analysis, mostly with regard to molecular sequences. Um, it turns out that many of the animals we're looking at in the deep sea have never been seen before. And so before we understand the role that they play in the deep sea, we have to describe them. We get to give them new names. Um, so uh, that's a lot of what we're doing right now is just trying to identify and name some of the species that we're seeing. And then once we do that, we'll be able to hopefully start understanding the role that they play in the ecosystem. That's really cool that you discover new species and you get to make names for them. So I know our audience is very curious about what a typical day is like for you, especially when your research lab is the open sea. Can you share with us a typical day when you were in the office versus when you were in the open ocean? I sure wish I could, but one of my favorite things about my job is that there is no typical day. Um, it really does vary. So I could describe a day in the office versus a day in the field, because those two can be a little bit different. If I'm in the office, what I'll usually do is I'll go in, um, and I'll spend some time in the morning just trying to keep my inbox empty. Um, and so that's one of my one of my time management things that I like to do is I don't like to have messages in my inbox. And so uh, I'll try to get rid of all the in messages in the morning. Uh, and then I'll hopefully get some time to work in the lab and start trying to work up some of the DNA that we had collected on previous expeditions or I'll spend the day walking around and talking to some of my colleagues about some of the work that they're doing because one of my other jobs is outreach. And some of what I do is try to share the work that my colleagues are doing with the general public. Um, in the field, it could really vary. Uh, and sometimes the two overlap because sometimes I'll go diving in the middle of the day or in the morning or the afternoon, it really varies. Uh, but for instance, right now I have a field expedition coming up next week. Uh, where I'll be going um, out to the island of uh, Hawaii and doing some blackwater diving off the island of Kona. And that's diving at night uh, in deep water where the water is over a thousand meters deep. And what we're doing is we're trying to collect animals that are migrating to the surface as part of this large diurnal migration where they come up at night to feed and go back during the day to um, keep themselves safe. Uh, so obviously that's nighttime, so the daytime is going to be spent doing something else, so. 
Wow, that's really cool that you can flip between office and like being in the ocean whenever you really want. Um, so Dr. Matsumoto, what advice can you give to someone who's interested in becoming a marine biologist? That's a great question. So if you're interested in becoming a marine biologist, one of the first things you'll find is that there's going to be a lot of people who will try to talk you out of it. Uh, they'll tell you that it doesn't pay well and that it's hard to find jobs. And both of those things happen to be true. So I'm not, not going to try to sugarcoat it, uh, but you could earn a living at it. And my feeling has always been that if you really want something and you're really focused on doing something, you're going to be good at it. And if you're going to be good at it, you'll more than likely get a job, at least I hope so. And so when I've had students come to me when I was a professor and they tell me they want to work with dolphins, which is a fairly common desire uh, from undergraduate students, uh, I'll do my best to talk them out of it. Um, the two students that I was not able to talk out of are now working with marine mammals. And so, you know, if, if you really want to do it, just go to it prepared to uh, spend uh, a good portion of your time doing something that you love. And if you love it, you'll be good at it. Thank you for that really good advice. I think it's always important to follow your dreams. I know another very important aspect of your job at Envari is community outreach. Can you talk to us about some of the outreach programs you currently have with your community? I would love to. So one of my favorite programs is our internship program. And so for any of you students out there, not when you're in high school, unfortunately, but once you get to college, we have an intern program, internship program for college students, undergraduates, graduate students, as well as educators to come to the Research Institute for 10 weeks uh, during the summer, and it's a full-time paid position, and work with any of our staff on any of the projects that we've got going. Um, so it's a wide range of different projects. And I've been running that program now for 25 years. I have a educator professional development program that I run during the summer, uh, which is a week long, trying to share some of the work that we do with educators um, so that we could get some of the data that we're collecting into the classrooms. And then the latest project is a very large federally funded project. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. And we're putting out profiling floats. And these are floats that spend nine days at 1,000 meters. And then on the 10th day, they go down to 2,000 meters. And then they go up to the surface and they profile the entire water column and collect biogeochemical data and then send all that data back over a satellite to us on shore. And they'll do this every 10 days for five years. And we're putting out 500 of these floats over the next five years. And my job for outreach is to get them adopted by schools and after school groups. So if your school's interested in adopting a float, uh, let me know. And we could get a float with your school's name on it or whatever name your school comes up with. And it'll be in the database for the next five years collecting data. Wow, that's really cool. I'm probably going to have to tell my school about it so they can buy a float. <laughs> so as the Senior Education Specialist at Ambari, can you provide us with some specifics of your duties in this role? Sure. So one of, one of my, oh, and, and just as an aside, there's no charge to adopt no float. So <laughs> nothing, nothing keeping you back. That's um, good. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my favorite things that I do at the Research Institute as part of my job, aside from everything else that I just talked about, is I'm also the liaison, the link between two different institutions, the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institution. So we're two different institutions, different locations, different mission, different staff, um, but we, we like each other. So we cooperate and we uh, help each other out as much as we can. And right now the Monterey Bay Aquarium is working on this fabulous deep sea exhibit that's gonna be opening up in April of 2022. And it's gonna be spectacular. So we're spending at the Research Institute, we're spending a lot of time helping out the aquarium uh, with their exhibit development. Um, and trying to get everything ready for the grand opening next year. Wow, it's really cool that you're like the person in between to make sure all the communication goes through between the Research Institute and the aquarium. It's a good thing I like to talk. <laughs> so Dr. Matsumoto, I know we've covered a lot of ground today and it sounds like you have quite a lot on your plate but really enjoy what you are doing. Is there something you would like to share with our audience as they explore STEM and careers in STEM? 
Oh, absolutely. There, there's a couple of things that I really wish I had done when I was in school. Um, and part of, I, part of the reason I didn't was because it wasn't available and because I'm old. And that's programming. Computer programming is becoming an essential skill, not only in STEM, but in all fields. Everybody uses computers. And the more familiar you are with computers and how they work, and if you're able to do any type of programming, I think the more marketable you'll be, the easier it is uh, to find a job in the future with some programming skills. So I would highly recommend that. The other thing I would recommend would be English classes. Um, English is really important, uh, particularly being able to write and speak well. And because it really doesn't make a difference if you find the most remarkable thing in the world, if you can't communicate that find to the public. And so there are a lot of researchers that I know of who are not very good about explaining their research to the public, which is really a shame because they're doing some amazing things. Um, and that's, you know, on one hand, on, that's on one hand. The other hand is that that's where part of my job comes in is I get to help them explain that to the public. Thank you for that really great advice. I think it's something that people sometimes tend to forget about because everyone uses computers and it's always important to communicate what you found. So I would like to thank my guest, Dr. Matsumoto for uh, joining us today. It was really great speaking with you and thank you for spending time with us. And to our viewers, please join us again for another exciting episode and another remarkable STEM professional. You have been listening to Profiles in STEM. Thank you. Katie Colbert signing off.